Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, May 11th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, vaccines kill and maim children in Mexico. And what really happened in the Bin Laden raid? That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, former Navy SEAL reveals that he is the man that killed Puff the Magic Dragon. He promises he did, but the other witnesses, their helicopter blew up and the families think they were killed, so the Navy SEAL. Today, Pulitzer Prize winning author Seymour Hersh revisits the story about the killing of Osama bin Laden. Of course, he hasn't believed this from the beginning, neither have we. In an article on the London Review of Books, he says the killing was a high point of Obama's first term and a major factor in his reelection. Yes, of course, it was actually scripted and served up to the voters by Sony, releasing Zero Dark Thirty just before the election. And then he goes on to say the White House story might have been written by Lewis Carroll. In other words, it's like something straight out of Alice in Wonderland. And here's how he sums it up. He says, high level lying nevertheless remains the modus operandi of U.S. policy along with secret prisons, drone attacks, special forces night raids, bypassing the chain of command, and cutting out those who might say no, and I guess that is to any and all of this. Now, in other details, we reported on this today uh, on the story at Infowars.com. Paul Joseph Watson writes, he says, on the subject of the Navy SEAL raid that supposedly resulted in the death of Al-Qaeda terror leader, Hirsch remarked, nothing has been done about that story. It is one big lie, not one word of it is true. He added that the Obama administration habitually lies, but that they continue to do so because the press allows him to get away with it. He says, it's pathetic. They are more than obsequious. They are afraid to pick on this guy, meaning Obama. Of course they're obsequious. We can see that in the way they cover Jade Helm. They never want to talk about anything other than it's a conspiracy theory. They don't want to look at the mission of Jade Helm. They don't want to consider what is behind this or what the proper role of the military should be, whether we should be having these kinds of exercises in public places of this scale. What should the mission of the military be? Well, we should just be quiet and do whatever the government says. That's what you're going to get from the establishment's press. He points out the White House said that the corpse was immediately buried at sea. And of course, we're going to have some clips here. We're going to play going back a couple of years when we talked to uh, family members of SEAL Team 6 that died shortly after this raid. Of course, it quickly emerged that this wasn't true. Numerous analysts have claimed that bin Laden had in fact been dead for years, that the raid on his alleged compound in Pakistan was little more than a stunt. And we're going to play a clip from Steve Pachinik, who talked to Alex Jones about this very issue today. Also, he says, the narrative in the timeline of the raid has changed multiple times. We see Situation Room photos showing Obama watching the raid live, when in fact there was a blackout on the live feed. And why were neighbors in the immediate area surrounding the compound said there was, that they were absolutely certain they had never seen bin Laden and that they knew of no evidence whatsoever to suggest that he lived there? Yes, it is very troubling. And Hirsch concludes by saying this, the Republic is in trouble. We lie about everything and lying has become the staple. Absolutely. We are not allowed to know anything from the government when they do condescend to tell us something they obviously lied to us about it. Just as we saw with Jade Helm, the very first thing the government did was to deny that they had any knowledge whatsoever of the slides. Then they came to Bastrop to explain the slides that they had denied existed. Let's go back to this bin Laden death though. Going back to a clip from May 2011, we have Alex Jones talking about this in an article Flashback proof that bin Laden's death was another government lie. We've embedded that, and of course, we're not going to play the entire clip there, but you can look at that yourself. See what we told you four years ago. So we point out bin Laden was a straw man villain. He was connected by Western military intelligence apparatus to take the blame for the orchestrated terror that was scripted and carried out by globalist allied factions. The phantom Osama bin Laden was a skeleton key that opened the door to foreign intervention in the Middle East or anywhere else that al-Qaeda might be or might be claimed to be. The motive is simple. Ever-expanding wars for the military-industrial complex and the often more lucrative periods of reconstruction. In other words, break down the nation and then rebuild it. Now, shortly after the raid that killed Osama bin Laden, 
Alex Jones went on. This was back August 6, 2011. He wrote this. He said, AP sources are reporting a statistically impossible tragedy for U.S. forces in Afghanistan. That 30 of the 38 NATO forces killed in a helicopter crash on Friday night, more than 20 were members of SEAL Team 6, the covert unit that took credit for killing Osama bin Laden in May. Alex Jones predicted shortly after that raid, now remember he wrote that this is an article that was written about three months later, but he said at the time the raid happened, Alex predicted that the SEALs would soon be reported dead in a helicopter crash or a staged incident following multiple reports from military sources who have proved accurate in the past, including on-air callers, the SEALs did indeed die during this raid. Now here's a clip that we have of an interview that Alex conducted a couple of days after that with members of the uh, fa family members of SEAL Team 6 that were furious about the lies that they had been told, the discrepancies that they had been told, told that their, that their uh, sons had died in the crash. Nevertheless, they could see that they had been in a firefight from pictures that were uh, given to them, yet they were given a book that had uh, no ink in it. Very strange uh, things had happened with these families. They were calling for an investigation at the time. Let's play this clip from a Mr. Strange, whose son was part of that SEAL Team 6 that died. Bin Laden's body was dumped into the water off the Northern Arabian Sea after an Islamic ritual that included the ceremonial washing of his body and wrapping in white sheets. They conducted a 50-minute ceremony. And, uh, and then he gave me a, a bullshit book with no ink. If your son was killed, Mr. Jones, and they gave you a book with no ink, I was with my mom yesterday. She said, you're lucky. They're lucky. Grandpa ain't alive. He'd be going right through the front doors of that white house to, to Obama. Trace left 10 days after my son got killed. David, I never stepped foot on a battlefield for Trace, with the, who always had a girlfriend, Paula Broadwell. He's going to come in. I want to talk to him because eight months later, Benghazi happened. He leaves 10 days after my son gets killed. They promote him to the CIA and then Benghazi. Admiral Eric Olson, two days after my son gets killed, he's gone. Admiral McRaven gets promoted. General Votel, that all this is in August 2011. Again, as I pointed out just before we ran that clip, Alex had said right after the supposed raid against Osama bin Laden, something like this would happen. We didn't believe the raid was true from the get-go. It was clear from the false details they were giving about the burial at sea that was total baloney. They changed their story multiple times in just a couple of days. We knew it was a false narrative. We called it from the very beginning, and unfortunately, that's the way they handled it, taking out SEAL Team 6, people who could contradict their story. That clip where we're talking to the family members, that is after they have been investigating this for two years. Now, today we had Steve Pachinik on, and of course, he never bought this from the beginning either. He also believed that Osama bin Laden had died quite some time earlier from his physical condition. Here's what Steve Pachinik had to say today. Well, I, I, uh, I've known about Cyrus. We come from the opposite sides of the ideological spectrum, but he's very well versed in intelligence. And he is very accurate. There was no raid. There basically was no stand. The stand down was, as we said, at Cheney, Bush, Rumsfeld. And basically, this is a CIA operation. It was run by the CIA and implemented by the CIA, started by Tennant, John Brennan. And what we have is a real problem of credibility in our military, in our political leadership, and in our intelligence leadership. And what this brings out is like the Milai massacre, the cover-up is major. It goes from Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, it goes to uh, Bush, uh, to Bush Jr., Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Obama. And basically it puts into place uh, Admiral McRaven, who was in charge of the special forces, or the SEAL team who claimed all this nonsense about how well they performed, and then puts into play Admiral Mullen, who was also a liar. I said it from day one they were liars. I said they were ineffectual. I said the SEAL teams were blown out of proportion. It was a publicity stunt. And now more than ever, Cy Hirsch has made it very clear. Now, I and Cy Hirsch have not agreed, and I've had a confrontation with him in an intelligence meeting. So for him to come out on our side to basically say the government's lying again and again, this is the key point for your listeners to understand. We have a government that is not legitimate. Obama has lied repeatedly. From the beginning till now, he has lied. Our military has lied. 
our intelligences lie. So we have candidates who are coming in, like uh, Hillary Clinton, who also lied. She was part of it. And again, Steve Pachenik flatly saying there was no raid. Flatly saying that Bush and Cheney and Clinton and Obama were all lying about all of this. And pointing out the other people who were involved, just as the SEAL's father pointed out that McRaven was lying about what was going on. McRaven, of course, who was head of special forces at the time. Again, Steve Pachenik called him out, said Admiral McRaven, who claimed all this nonsense about how the SEALs had performed. Now understand that uh, General McRaven, who at the time, as I said, was head of special forces, uh, in a article back in 2013 from the U.S. Department of Defense, they say, McRaven says, success in human domain is fundamental to special ops. Understand that this is tied essentially to what is going on at Jade Helm. Of course, Jade Helm is nothing new. It is just greater in scope as well as we see these urban exercises increasing in frequency. But looking at the human domain to master it, to bring together all of our metadata is fundamental to the mission, said McRaven. And of course, this is back in 2013 when he was commander of U.S. Special Operations. He says, establishing trust with humans who occupy the space is a very key thing. Again, we see that repeated in Operation Jade Helm. He says, building and, understa building and understanding and trust takes time. But once it's built, we can apply unique capabilities that are designed to assess, analyze, operate, and prevail in population-centric strategies or struggles. In other words, what they are trying to do, as we've said from the very beginning, is a major part of Jade Helm is to get control of local political leaders, to see if they're going to resist, see if they're going to go along. We see that playing out now. And he goes on to say, this is McRaven at the time, any discussion of global special operation forces network is incomplete without including the human domain. He says the power of the network is derived from linking knowledgeable entities that are geographically dispersed. Again, mapping people's political beliefs, mapping where they, uh, what they think about politics, what their religion is, all these different variables, knowing who you are, knowing who you know, following your actions, and then mapping them, as we've said, mapping the human domain. He says, done right, networking enables special operation forces to share information, to collaborate with partners, to develop a shared awareness. Now, understand, everything the government is talking about now in terms of trying to control the internet is all about information sharing. When we talked to you at the end of last week about what mastering the human domain means, about the field of human domain analytics, we pointed out that they were very keen on grabbing metadata, which of course we were told by the NSA that was something that was completely harmless, that wasn't anything that they could identify you about specifically. But that's not what they've been doing. And of course, they were lying about that just as they were lying about the dragnet surveillance. Clapper has been involved in geospatial intelligence, being the director, being appointed director in September of 2001. Does that sound familiar, that date? Does that ring a bell? Ever since then, he has been director and been intimately involved being keynote speaker at these geospatial intelligence operations where they are using the military as well as the intelligence community as well as law enforcement to map out the population of the United States. It ties together all of these agencies and it ties it together as a domestic operation. And then consider this quote, which I find to be very chilling. He says, building understanding of the human domain requires boots on the ground feeding information into the network. That is Admiral McRaven again. Think of this as boots on the ground for the national security state, for the national surveillance agencies, okay? This is what this is all about. For the NSA, for the CIA, for the Director of National Intelligence, they want special forces to operate as boots on the ground. He's concerned that the special forces have gotten away from their traditional uh, role, and that is of sabotage, of nation building, of political psyops. He says there's been too much of the kinetic operations. See, that's what you think of when you're looking at a military exercise. You think this is about guys jumping out of planes or doing what he calls kinetic exercises. No, it really is about mind war, and it's about getting guys on the ground. Another reminder of that is this article from Newcoin. 
They say the U.S. government is developing a matrix-like world simulating the virtual you. Well, they've been doing this for a very long time. This is nothing new. They do keep coming up with new, improved programs, however, but the intelligence and the approach has been there for a very long time. They say it's not surprising that data in the information age can be extremely valuable, even a source of power. That's how they will master you, is through the data they collect on you. Now, the concept they call sentient world simulation. And here's what they point out. They say that sentient world simulation is actually a continuously running, continuously updated mirror model of the real world in parallel on a computer designed to predict and evaluate future events and courses of action. In other words, all this is about predictive crime. This is all about predicting what you're going to do and shut you down before you do it. And of course, it's also about activity-based intelligence. All the human domain analytics, the activity-based intelligence, it all collects your uh, operations uh, moving about in the physical world, as well as what you do on social media and your metadata. And they go on to say that U.S. defense, intelligence, and homeland security officials are involved in constructing this project. Again, we see the admitted merging of these three branches, the police state, the surveillance state, and the military, all merging together. Finally, they say the project is dangerous and intrusive enough that one of its researchers even quit, citing concerns about the possibility of handing over such a dangerous weapon to a top secret agent, see, with, no, with little accountability. Actually, it should say with no accountability. The centralized control of personal and social information by a single entity gives it immense and unprecedented power. That's what we need to be concerned about. That's what we need to be concerned about with all these different branches of government, but it's the consolidation it's being done domestically, and this is the power of dragnet surveillance combined with the military. As General McRaven had pointed out, they only need to put in a linear number of nodes on the ground, that's these boots on the ground for intelligence, in order to get exponentially greater information. He says that this is achieved with a signature footprint of special operation forces. So it's not about a large footprint, it's about what special forces bring in 80 plus countries around the world, sometimes with only a couple of operators at remote locations working face to face with our partners. So when you look at that in that context, the idea that they would bring 60 people into one small area in Bastrop or 1,200 people into Texas is actually quite large. Now finally, when we look at what's going on and we look at this exercise combined with the fact that the Patriot Act is coming up for reauthorization, is it any wonder that we're seeing a lot of reports about terrorist threats coming up. In an article on InfoWars today, we have dubious ISIS terror threats as the Patriot Act comes up for reauthorization. And they have a quote here from Ronald Bailey, where he says, the threat of terrorism by homegrown jihadis is minimal. As Mother Jones pointed out in 2013, there's only been 17 people killed in Islamic terrorists in the U.S., since September 11, 2001 atrocities. And terrorism, even on the scale of 9-11, does not pose an existential threat to our country. However, the growth of turnkey totalitarianism does. And of course, although Mother Jones won't say it, 9-11 was about creating the environment so they could create turnkey terrorism. Well, stay with us right after the break. We're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about a tragic incident with vaccines in Mexico, as well as a cancer vaccine they're touting coming out of Cuba. What's that all about? We'll have that information when we come back. Stay with us. A chemical spill contaminating the water supply in nine West Virginia counties. What are the health effects of having these drugs in our drinking water? It's forced medical treatment without the consent of residents. My friends, water filtration is one of the most basic actions you can take to protect you and your family from the harmful toxins and heavy metals in your tap water. On average, the county says it sprays with the glyphosate at least once a week. Few filters cut out the glyphosate that is found in water supplies worldwide. Remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, hydrofluorosyl acid, sodium hexafluorosilicate. Fluoride it is in tea, it's in coffee, it's in water, it's in bread, it's in toothpaste. It is our responsibility to protect our families. The establishment's not going to do it. It's time to take action. It's time to filter our water. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today and for a limited time, use the promo code WATER20 and get 20% off all ProPure products. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or give our crew a call at 888-253-3139. 
the knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Welcome back. Now, as a reminder of what can go wrong with any medical treatment and why we need to have informed consent from those of us who are getting the medication, CNN reports that two babies have died and dozens have been hospitalized after vaccinations in southern Mexico. They say Mexican health officials are investigating after two babies died and 29 children were hospitalized from suspected adverse reactions to shots from the country's national vaccination program. Now, that's about 60 percent of the children who are vaccinated at this particular location. They say the parents of the two infants who died were so outraged at the government that they refused to let authorities perform autopsies. They say that illnesses were reported after 52 children from the rural mining community were given vaccines for tuberculosis, rotavirus, and hepatitis B. Later that night, 31 of the children presented adverse reactions. Residents said the vaccinations were offered on Friday when officials came to the community and announced over loudspeakers that vaccinations would be given to newborns. It doesn't sound like they had a choice in that. Uh, they were just told that they were going to be given to the newborns. Is it kind of this thing like, uh, shut up and just take your damn vaccine? That's what we're seeing. But of course, in America, we need to understand that the vaccine companies have been given immunity from any problems that come out of their vaccinations. You may not get immunity from the disease, but they will have legal immunity if they damage you. So they're going to have to stick a gun to our heads in order to do it. And that's what they're planning on doing. Now, remember, when we look at this, that there have been questions in the past going back to uh, November of last year. We had an article on Infowars.com. Is the U.N. using vaccines to secretly sterilize women all over the globe? Now, in that article, we pointed out that vaccines given in Mexico and the Philippines were a little bit suspicious. Now, this is a different situation than the infants that were given multiple vaccines and then 60 percent of them had adverse reactions. This is also being done, however, in Mexico and other third world country countries. They say that What's suspicious about this is that only women are vaccinated and only women between the ages of 15 and 45, in other words, childbearing ages. They also found a particular hormone, HCG, in the vaccines. And of course, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has been actively involved for more than 20 years in the development of an anti-fertility vaccine utilizing that same hormone. And they tied it to tetanus toxoid as a carrier, the exact same coupling that's been found in the Mexican, Philippine, Nicaragua vaccines. Something for us to think about. And as we look at this, remember that there's been a lot of buzz in the last few days about how Cuba has some kind of a miraculous lung cancer vaccine. It turns out that it isn't all that miraculous if you look at the details. Of course, Wired reports uh, Cuba has a lung cancer vaccine and America wants it. Actually, it's really Big Pharma that wants it. They want to force you to buy it. And they ask a question in the article, which I think is a good question. How did Cuba end up with cutting-edge immuno-oncology drugs? Okay, this is a country that is incredibly poor. Well, it turns out, if you read the article, they don't really have much of anything, I don't think. They say that lung cancer is the fourth leading cause of death in Cuba. Of course, they smoke a lot of cigars. They say that these shots are extremely cheap. They say each shot costs the government only about $1. A phase two trial from 2008 showed lung cancer patients who received the vaccine lived an average of four to six months longer than those who didn't. Four to six months. That's all this vaccine will give you. It's not very effective. Now, it also isn't very expensive in Cuba. It's probably going to be a lot more expensive when it comes to America. But I, the gist of these articles that are hailing this as some kind of a 
uh, magnificent breakthrough are really about selling the idea of socialist medicine. They go on and on and on about how Cuba has done so much with so little because they're communists. That's what's really behind this. So they're selling that agenda. And of course, they want to sell an ineffective, potentially dangerous vaccine in America, and they will sell it for a lot more than a dollar a piece. It hasn't done anything to keep lung cancer from being the number four killer in uh, Cuba, and at the very best, it will give them four to six months additional. Now, how do we stop this kind of medical tyranny that would force us to take things without our informed consent? Realize that the other side of that, of course, if they can make you take something without your informed consent, they can also withhold things that you would like to take that you think might help you. Things that are experimental drugs or perhaps things that are prohibited by fiat, like medical marijuana. The answer is nullification. The New American has an article that came out today. Nullification is spreading. Minnesota invalidates FDA restrictions. And this is all about nullifying restrictions on typical medications or medical treatments that the FDA has not approved. This comes from a Minnesota rep who had an incredible experience when he was 15 years old. He was told that he only had months to live. He was informed he would not be able to get a heart transplant, but he was told by his doctors that he might be saved by a surgical procedure that was still experimental. He said, it was my right to try it. I fully believe that life is worth fighting for and government has no role in getting in the way. So this Minnesota State Representative, Nick Zerwas, has now pushed through a law that will allow others to do what he did, what saved his life. And bear in mind the Oregon senator, who is also a doctor, who did something very similar in her life. She was told by her doctor, as well as the pharmaceutical company, that she should not take interferon for her uh, condition while she was breastfeeding. Nevertheless, she did her own research, she went against the advice of her physician, she went against the advice of the drug company, and she took that medication, interferon. She would not allow other people, though, to have informed consent when it comes to vaccines. She would take that away from all of us. So what he is doing here is the other side of this, allowing us to take uh, medications, some of them experimental, without the permission of the FDA. Because right now, you can take some experimental drugs from the FDA, but you have to get express prior approval from the FDA. Now, understand, that is tyranny. Look at what our founders said. Jefferson said that whenever government assumes undelegated powers like this, the power of life and death, the power to tell you whether you can take a drug or the power to force you to take a drug, it has no authority. It is void. It is of no force. That is the principle where states nullify an overreaching federal government that is doing things which it has no legal authority to do and for which it has no moral authority quite clearly. And of course, that's backed up by the 10th Amendment. Now, in other news, we see candidate Jeb Bush coming out and saying that he would have invaded Iraq just like his brother. That's why we don't need another SOB as president, another son of a Bush. He says uh, that pointed out that the Democrat frontrunner, Hillary Clinton, also voted for authorization for the use of force in Iraq before the invasion. Well, I would say we don't want her either. I don't think so. But uh, anyway, he says, given the intelligence that we were confronted with, pretty much everybody would have done that. See, what they would not do is question the intelligence. They would never question what they get from the CIA is what he's saying. I guess he's concerned that maybe if he did, he'd be labeled a conspiracy theorist for being a skeptic, for wanting information, for doing research, for get, digging down and seeing what's really behind this. No, just go along with the consensus no matter what happens. Now, he was in uh, Liberty University lauding his Christian conscience this weekend. He was telling them that that was one of the most important things you can have. He says there's no more powerful or liberating influence on earth than a Christian conscience in action, implying that that's what he has. It says, he didn't talk about his efforts as governor to save the life of a severely brain-damaged woman, Terry Chavo, whose husband sought to remove her from her feeding tube over the objection of her parents. Quote, that made him a hero to the right to life movement, said Jerry Falwell's son. Well, you know what? Didn't make him a hero to me. Didn't make him a hero to a lot of people in the right to life movement because we understood that he had the power 
just like he had the power or his brother had the power to take a look at the intelligence, Jeb Bush had the power to stop that execution by a probate judge, slowly starving her to death. At the time, it was one of the most hypocritical things I've ever seen in my life to see the Bush brothers parading about their Christian connections with people like the Faldwells while they were also starving a woman to death. He had the power, he had the authority, he could have stopped it, but he didn't. But here he is at Liberty University telling people that he's going to stop Obamacare because that could try, they, they've tried to use that to force abortions on people. He aborted a fully grown adult. He allowed a probate judge who was under him to do it. He could have stopped it. He did nothing. That's the kind of hypocrisy that we can expect to see from Bush, the kind of go along to get along and the no respect for life, whether it's one individual or whether it's an entire country like Iraq that you unleash massive warfare on without any reason whatsoever. Now stay with us right after the break. We have a special report about this homeschooling family in Kentucky that had their 10 children kidnapped by CPS and the Sheriff's Department because they were off the grid. And after that, we're going to talk to someone who made the trip from New York City to living off the grid in Montana and the obstacles that he overcame, the financial obstacles as well as the health obstacles that he had to overcome in order to do that. Stay with us, we'll be right back. My name is Alex Jones. Most of you know me from my syndicated radio program and my documentary films, as well as InfoWars Nightly News. When I got on air 20 years ago, I had discovered the globalist program, their plan to take over the world, and my focus went from running six miles every other day, swimming two, three miles a couple times a week, and lifting weights to focusing on fighting the globalist. I've gone from 279 pounds all the way down to 235 pounds and the weight's going off even faster. Super Male Vitality, Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine, and Oxy Powder. Those three products of the entire family of InfoWarsLife.com products are the most important from my own personal experience. And it wasn't just that my weight loss accelerated, my muscle mass increased, my stamina, my energy levels exploded. Now is the time to take action. Start your journey today with the Alex Challenge Pack. It's the trifecta of change. Secure yours today and get free shipping for a limited time at InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. For all of recorded history, civilizations around the world praised the health benefits of silver. At InfoWars Life, our mission is to bring you the highest quality, purest, cleanest, effective colloidal silver on the market today for the lowest price available. When it comes to you and your family's health, InfoWarsLife.com is very excited to announce our biggest run yet of Silver Bullet Colloidal Silver, exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Now, InfoWarsLife.com has taken colloidal silver to the next level using a cutting-edge technique that is free of toxic artificial additives. Now more than ever, it's important to stock up on high-quality Silver Bullet from InfoWarsLife.com and to help others during Christmas by teaching them about the powerful benefits of silver. Secure your Silver Bullet today at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. Child Protective Services. The name says it all. CPS claims that they are out to protect children from abusive and neglectful parents, but is that just a ruse in order to take healthy children away from good families? To place them in the foster care system where they receive bounties from the federal government? That's right. The average reimbursement to state and local government for each child taken into foster care is about $6,000 a month. The foster care provider receives about $600 a month of that. Therefore, each one of these kids forced into foster care are worth approximately $5,000 to CPS. Two foster parents had criminal records, a son living there with multiple felonies, and a convicted sex offender visiting and sometimes caring for the children. She refused to arrange an adoption. Her CPS supervisors responded with this memo recommending the adoption should proceed quickly. Our theory is that the basis for this is the, the tie to the federal money. That every time a child is not placed in a home, 
the state of Kentucky through its cabinet is losing federal money. Child Protective Services in Pennsylvania was at her doorstep taking her one day old baby because they thought Liz was abusing drugs. But what the hospital didn't consider more closely was poppy seeds. Grab your baby and don't resist and don't fight me, okay? We reached out to CPS. They say they can't specifically comment on this case because of privacy law, but we wanted to know what the rules are and what rights parents have. CPS says we conduct a risk assessment of the child's safety and rely heavily on the direction of health care providers. And now Anna and Alex find themselves fighting for Sammy's return and for their rights as parents. Where there's children, there are pedophiles, uh, you know, they're in schools and they're in churches and they're everywhere where they can get their hands on children. So we know that that's true. And it's, it's got to be brought to an end. It's got to be completely exposed for what it is. And in my opinion, it needs to completely be, uh, completely be dissolved. I, I don't see any good left in Child Protective Services. Senator Nancy Schaefer and her husband Bruce were found dead today at their Habersham County home. The bodies of former state Senator Nancy Schaefer and her husband Bruce were found today at their Habersham County home. Investigators say both had been shot. Preliminarily, it looks to be a murder-suicide. Uh, the GBI has six agents on the scene, two crime scene specialists. Uh, there will be a thorough investigation. CPS adversary Senator Nancy Schaefer and her husband's life met a very abrupt end. There are far too many oddities surrounding her life for it to have been anything but an assassination due to her outspoken crusade to uncover one of the prime child smuggling areas in the United States, Atlanta, Georgia. Bruce was retired and the couple didn't appear to be in any type of dire financial crisis. Friends who knew the couple best state that Bruce would simply not have had the capability to kill his wife. Nancy was actively exposing corruption within the Department of Family and Child Services, including actions by the DFCS director in the county where she lived. Nancy's husband, Bruce, was highly supportive of Nancy's work for decades and would have had little or no reason to suddenly try to kill her at such a critical juncture in her career. Imagine you're a happy family living in Central Texas in a suburb of Austin, Round Rock. And one night you decide to smoke some marijuana after your two-year-old daughter's gone to bed while you watch a movie. Something over 100 million Americans are estimated to do every single week. A good secret police neighbor smells the marijuana, calls the police, and they come with the CPS and take your two-year-old happy daughter who'd never been in the hospital and never been sick and never been beaten up. You go for weekly visits with your daughter and she's dirty, she's confused, she has black eyes, bruises, mold is growing on her body and her clothing. You go to the state and say, she's being abused, help her, and they laugh at you. And a month later you get the call, she's on life support, her head has been caved in. Two days later they take her off life support and she dies. Another victim of this tyrannical government that we have that is incentivizing the states to seize as many children as they can. Over a million of them a year. Police seized 10 children from an off-grid homeschool family in Kentucky on Wednesday after receiving an anonymous tip about the family's traditional lifestyle. They're saying they're unvaccinated and that, quote, they didn't have proof they were getting full schooling. There's no law against homeschooling, not yet. They're trying to pass them in, what, three different states right now. Uh, but this is just crazy, and I see these articles all the time. There's a new one in World Net Daily today where they show up and say, we want to see your vaccine records, and we want to make sure that you don't have any guns. Well, you're allowed to have guns, and you're allowed to not vaccinate. So the, the government's claiming that it's neglect when it's not neglect, plus there's no judge or jury. The nightmare story began when sheriff's officers set up a blockade around Joe and Nicole Nogler's rural property before entering the premises. Eight of the kids were out with their father, but Nicole and two of her oldest children were at home. Nicole attempted to drive away, but was subsequently stopped and arrested for resisting, attempting to prevent officers from taking her two boys away. The refusal to say, no, you will not talk to my children. No, you will not do that. The court is going to step in, and I think that they will remove your children. And they will talk to your children whether you like that or not. So I, don't I have, have no a dog right to the in parent. this fight. 
other than I'm telling you. I have constitutional rights. I have rights as a parent, and my children won't take anybody rights. without my permission, without an attorney or anything. And yeah, if exactly. there's non-compliant, and we get those court orders, and the things that you're posting on Facebook are true, ten ways to deal with the police, and oh, you guys are stalking my page. I'm glad blah, you guys blah, read blah, stuff. Blah 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 blah. We will bring a SWAT team in here and do what we have to do. The sheriff then demanded Joe Nogler turn over the eight children by 10 a.m. the next day or face felony charges, an order with which he complied. They are an extremely happy family, said family friend Pace Ellsworth, who asserts that the Noglers were targeted because of their back-to-basics life. They have a whole lot of kids. They are educating their children themselves. Their children thrive on healthy foods. The family grows and raises themselves. And they have a 26-acre private playground on which to play and get exercise. The horror. (laughs) As you can see, they're extremely open about the way they live, and they just want it to be accepted. There are people that don't understand that and that um, misrepresent the way that they live. And and because of that, um, you know, it's sort of satisfied a vendetta for the sheriff against them. Friends reported no concerns about how the children were being treated by their parents who follow an educational model called unschooling, where the children decide their own curriculum based on the subjects that interest them and what their strengths are. The family have set up a GoFundMe page to try and raise money for legal expenses. A website for the family spells out their plight with a heart-wrenching words. This Kentucky family of 12 people, six dogs, two farm cats, and a few random farm animals was just torn apart. Their crime? Living a simple, back-to-basics life. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, a WorldNet Daily report highlights how parents were interrogated by a CPS caseworker who questioned Christopher Zimmer and his wife Nicole on everything from their son's homeschool education to questions about vaccines and guns in the house. The Zimmers are now suing the CPS for $60 million in a case before the U.S. District Court in Trenton, New Jersey. John Bound for Infowars.com. From the water table to our soils to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com oil of oregano formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules you will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue wild crafted from the mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire this winter season it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano now available in our limited first run at infowarslife.com that's infowarslife.com or call 888-253-3139 Well, what are you going to do if you lose that great paying job? Or let's say you lose your pension because your company went bankrupt. Or let's say that the government decided that they're going to confiscate IRAs to pay for the government debt, a bail-in, if you will. Or let's just say that things continue to go along and we see the dollar continue to lose its value, or maybe that picks up and accelerates and goes to zero very rapidly. Well, those are all questions that our guest today, Rich, Sheban has uh, asked, and he has looked at a way to get an answer for that for himself and for you, a way to get self-sufficiency. We're going to talk to him about why you want that, as well as steps that he has taken 
and his book that explains how to do it a little bit at a time. So joining us today is the author of One New York Man's Journey to Off-Grid Living in Montana. He went from a New York City sales rep to someone who is self-sufficient in Montana and off the grid. Thank you for joining us, Rich. My pleasure, David. Thank you for having me. Now, I think it's a real interesting book, as I said in the introduction, uh, as well as a documentary. But it's not a grand leap from going to New York to living off the grid in Montana. It was a series of steps, and each one of those steps really gets you freer. Tell people why you wanted to do this, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the hows in terms of the individual steps. You bet. Well, you know, when I was forcefully retired from uh, Big Pharma, I worked for Glaxo, Smith, Klein, and Merck. I realized that options, especially for the middle class, not just for me, was definitely waning, David. And when I give talks or I do other radio shows, I talk about the financial, economic, social, and political reasons why we need to be more self-sufficient. Because it's pretty obvious we're being distracted, dumbed down, and divided as Americans. And we've been drunk on the Kool-Aid of political correctness by the, letting the powers that be create a tiered system of different rules, laws, and accountability. So I ask myself, how can we control our own destiny as Americans? And I realized that you look at food production with GMO foods, you, lo you look at the, the cost and inflation of foods, you look at the fact that GMOs cause cancer, changes your DNA, organ creates organ failure. Uh, we're not getting the nutrition to build our immune systems. So food had a lot to do with it. And then I wanted a little bit of acreage to grow my own uh, produce. I wanted to raise my own animals. And because we live off the grid, we, we harvest, uh, amperage and volts from a solar array. So I, I, fi I, I figured out that as Americans, we need, I need, because I'm practicing what I preach and, do, and doing this lifestyle, I need to offer ideas and solutions so the average American can simplify their life. People have lost the skills that we had uh, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. They don't know how to do this. They are completely dependent upon not just the power grid, but the entire grid of uh, jobs as well as food supply, that entire process is really set up to keep us dependent on it. And of course, we have the story of a family, a homeschool family in Kentucky that was living off the grid and did not have things like running water, just as you don't have uh, running water. And of course, anybody looks at this documentary, because you have a very nice house. There is no way that uh, is, is much nicer than uh, most of the houses that you'll see in urban areas by far. And yet, because they did not have city water, because they did not have a well, that's one of the key things that they mentioned about this Kentucky family where they took away all 10 children from them, saying they lived in squalor, implying that they lived in squalor because simply because they didn't have running water and a few other things like that. Yeah, well, I, I find when I hire homeschool kids, their work ethic, their communication skills, their listening skills are so much better. And I'm not per se downing public school kids because there's some really good ones with good work ethic. But the, the, the maturity of the homeschool kids, to, I, I find, is 10 to 1 better than the public school kids. In fact, I even have a, a little example in my book that I shared that uh, homeschool children, um, because of their listening skills, I notice in life, through my personal observation, they mm -hmm. are debt-free earlier in life than public school kids of uh, their same peers. You know, I think uh, having homeschooled my kids, I think a lot of it has to do, Rich, with the fact that they're just talking to adults or talking to people of all ages. They're not uh, rigorously age segregated, and they come in contact with people in a variety of different situations rather than being sat down in a chair and told they have to shut up and uh, just listen to somebody at the front of the class. So, I mean, just that part of it, I think, is, is very helpful. But let's talk about some of the different aspects that you've got in your book. Of course, you're talking about choosing your off-grid location, choosing and building your off-grid country home. In other words, types of houses that you would build. This is really kind of a step-by-step -step procedure that you outline in your book as well as in your documentary to help people to uh, maybe, you know, they're not going to be able to do everything at once, but they can look at which aspects they can do. Maybe just gardening. They can start out with that and start to become a little bit more self-sufficient step-by-step. Absolutely, David. I talk about this um, often on the radio or when I give a talk. Um, take baby steps. You don't have to jump into everything all at once, but you got to do a little reading. You got to do a little research. And 
I'm not saying that we're 100% self-sufficient. It's not, it's not like I drill my own oil and ref, refine my own gasoline, <laughs> but I'm probably 98% more self-sufficient than most Americans. And it's mostly because I enjoy nature. But you can do little baby steps like put put some uh, solar panels on your existing home. Maybe mm -hmm. buy a generator and figure out how that works. Do raised bed gardenings. Folks, if you're in suburban America and you're raking leaves and if you're uh, cutting grass, you can start the best compost pile in the world just with those and build your own soil. So you don't even have to live on a farm. There's a lot of fallacy about buying farmland. I do not have farmland here. I have mountainous land. I have lots of rock. I have glacial silt. I make my own soil. With We save every organic coffee ground. We save every radish top. We save our eggshell. And we put this in the compost pile with our goat manure and chicken manure, and we have the best compost in the world. So we make our own soil. With your There's raised bed. ways to do that. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I got the DVD video. I do talks, et cetera, because I feel obligated as an American to share these um, ideas and solutions because we all, as American people, David, we, it's normal. It's human nature to talk negative and to complain, but we have to balance our life with ideas and solutions, just like saving and spending, just like technology and nature. You know, we, we've got to regain those 19th century skills, but dovetail them with 21st century technology. Absolutely. And, you know, everything, every step that somebody takes, if you grow a few of your vegetables even, at least those vegetables, you are going to get good, clean vegetables that are GMO, pesticide-free, uh, anything that you can get in terms of eggs or hobby farm animals. If you can get generate some of your power, that's at least something that you're moving towards a step of self-sufficiency. And I think the thing that really blocks so many people is they look at all these different aspects of it. They don't think about tackling them one at a time. They don't think about making incremental process. I think that they got to uh, jump into it all at once, uh, even in each individual area that they've got to get complete energy self-sufficiency when they could just begin by adding a few solar power uh, panels. Absolutely. Look how many Americans who are listening to this right now, David, who are ha feel like they're hamsters on a treadmill running to nowhere. I mean, look at the investment portfolio, the savings portfolio, the game plans of today's youth. They're really running out of options. They're running out of ideas. And it, it, I get asked often, often on radio shows or talks, what is the greatest demise for the middle class in America? And I definitely say that it's ignorance, apathy, and indifference. But what's really killing us, folks, is the fear of the consequences of being politically incorrect. In other words, the fear of telling the truth. We need to bring back the mentor-protege relationship. We need to talk to people who practice what they preach and actually do this, and not by some elite who's wearing a $5,000 suit on one of the big uh, TV stations, which basically the, the, the old media, folks, is controlled by six corporations. Six. So just think how easy it is to change philosophies and ideologies. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the key things, Rich, is to think outside of the box. That's certainly something that you've done. That's something your book is very helpful about doing that. It's a very short book in terms of number of pages, but boy, it has a lot of information just like your documentary does. I think it was very amusing for me to see how you used a cone to, uh, uh, to take out a turkey, to, to kill a traffic cone to take out a turkey. Everybody that saw the video here was remarking about that. So there's a lot of things like that that are in it that are very helpful tips. Uh, but I think the key thing is, is that we look at people who are afraid to try something different. They're afraid to take a different path. That's why so many people go to college, even though they're going to come out with a degree that doesn't necessarily help them get a job. And they're going to be enslaved with a debt that they can't even get rid of with bankruptcy. And that's, I think, one of the saddest things to see how that kind of herd mentality is uh, putting people into that system that is working against their freedom and independence. Well, absolutely. I mean, aren't we tired of hearing race baiting questions, sex baiting, gender baiting? It's pretty obvious that they want to divide us into groups. All these politically but correct buzzwords, David, like equality, fairness, tolerance, uh, accountability, transparency, they're all virtual reality. They're an illusion. Let, let me just ask you, since, since you, you kind of dovetailed into economy a little bit, let me just ask you a, a quick scenario here, okay? Let's say you were my teacher, and you asked, and I was one of your students, and you asked the class 30 years ago, what would, it, what would you be doing 30 years in the future to create a good economy and, and actually have the words middle class and prosperity 
discussed in the same sentence, which it's not anymore. And let's say I wrote this paper and I talked about the Federal Reserve printing money, buying back debt, the U.S. Treasury giving out IOUs. You, it's easier to get a job and keep a job and sue, depending on what group you're in. Let's say the I ran the, the economy on no savings and debt, and the way, and I talked about the wealth discrepancy that that we have today. Let's say I eliminated mostly most of the free markets and supply and demand, and I said that government workers weren't supposed to serve the people anymore, but now they basically basically they're run by their own selfless ambition to use the people for their own benefit. Now, let's say I submitted that paper to you, David. What do you think you would give me if this happened 30 years ago and I submitted some of the ideas that I just share with you now? Well, well I think you'd be a, a paranoid conspiracy theorist, you know, but all That's those things right. have happened in your lifetime and mine, haven't they, Rich? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, very true. But you have a great plan here. We're out of time. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us. Your documentary, as well as your book, One New York Man's Journey to Off-Grid Living in Montana, an excellent resource for people who want to get there and understand that they can do it one bit at a time. You overcame these odds, and, uh, and hats off to you. you. You really have carved out a beautiful life for yourself against all the odds, Rich. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate you having me on. And again, I would stress, you don't have to do it all at once, and you don't even have to add an entire system at once. Take baby steps in one area and then baby steps in another. Everything that you can do to make yourself more self-sufficient enhances your life as well as your family's life. Rich's book is a great overview and gives you a great inspiration for why you need to do it and some steps on how to start with it. Well, that's it for tonight's news. If you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please subscribe. If you're not a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, that will be one way for you to help support our operation plus you can see it every weeknight, as it happens, 7 Central. You can also pass that on to 20 other friends, along with all of Alex Jones' documentaries. Well, join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central for the nightly news. InfoWars Life and InfoWarsLife.com is extremely excited to announce our latest release, Winter Sun, a revolutionary type of vitamin D3. Winter Sun is a premium quality vitamin D3 nutritional supplement. It is produced by extracting oil from healthy, nutrient-dense plants known as lichens. Every batch is analyzed for purity and D3 content. It's completely free of toxins and allergens. Simply put, if you want the best at an extremely low price, this is it. Winter Sun is the result of our pursuit of the best source of vitamin D3. The research and development took over two years, but the result, as verified by independent laboratories, is the best vegan vitamin D3 product in the world. Read the facts at InfoWarsLife.com about Winter Sun Vitamin D3. Not only does vitamin D3 promote a healthy mood, but vitamin D supports our memory and brain function, something the globalists are targeting. Visit InfoWars.com today or call 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.